welcome to this keynote presentation, Economic Megatrends for 2021 and Beyond. This is just one of more than 30 sessions that make up the Rising Economy Week, an immersive week-long virtual event co-hosted by the South Island Prosperity Partnership and the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. My name is Linda Hartford. I am the National Director of CIBC Trust Indigenous Markets, and I'm coming to you this morning from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen peoples of Victoria, British Columbia. SIP and this event are located, of course, on the traditional and unceded territories of the Lekwungen peoples, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. And so before we start today's presentation, we'd like to acknowledge our traditional hosts and offer gratitude for hosting our event today on their territories, as well as for their ongoing contribution to this important dialogue about prosperity in the South Island. CIBC, of course, is a proud partner with SIP and committed to the prosperity and wellness for all our island communities. We are so grateful to be invited to participate in this event and to have the opportunity to work with SIP on bringing its mission to life, a prosperous and vibrant economy. I'm so delighted to be able to introduce our first speaker today, my colleague at CIBC, Avery Shenfield. Avery, of course, is the Chief Economist of CIBC Capital Markets. Just a few words about Avery and we'll get started. Avery is one of Canada's leading economists. He is known for his perceptive analysis and his insight on economic development. Avery is a repeat winner of the Dow Jones Market Watch Forecasting Award and has received Bloomberg Markets Awards for forecasting accuracy on the Canadian and US economies. Avery is consistently ranked at one of, as one of Canada's top economists by institutional investors. He has addressed numerous business groups and has been quoted in the media in the US, Canada, and globally. More locally, Avery is a part of an advisory panel that works with the BC Ministry of Finance and provides advice to our province on budgets. Avery has visited the South Island many times and has told us that today his talk will provide the backdrop for many things that impact our region, including tourism. Please welcome Avery Schenfeld. Thanks very much. And uh, it's great to, I wish I could say, be there with you, uh, but virtually it'll have to be because I, I always enjoy my trips to uh, the South Island, to the Victoria region, uh, particularly when they come at a time when Toronto is looking kind of gray and gloomy and, and there you have uh, flowers and, and greenery and so on. It always reminds me of uh, the diversity of Canada's uh, climate. Uh, but in terms of the economy, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, I sometimes say that no country is an island. And from an economic perspective, no island is an island. So Victoria and the South Island, certainly part of what's happening not only North America, uh, North America, but globally. And so I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a backdrop into where we see in a big picture the world, Canada going, what some of the implications are for your region as you think about looking ahead to 2021 and beyond. And I call this presentation waiting for a shot in the arm, literally, because the reality we find ourselves right now is it's going to take a shot in the arm in the form of a vaccine to really turn things around uh, for your region and for the country and North America as a whole. And we've had some good news on that front that our forecast had been based on an assumption that around the middle of the year, we'd see a significant ramping up in 2021 of vaccination programs that looks to be on target and the vaccines look even more effective than we might have assumed. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train coming to hit us. It's a much better year in 2022. But what is 2021 gonna look like as we make this transition from the very topsy-turvy world we're living in now until hopefully by early 22, uh, a world that we're much more familiar with. So if you look at globally, uh, world GDP down about three and a half percent this year, that's a terrible year for the global economy because we typically have emerging market countries like China growing at you know six, seven, eight percent. And if you look down the column of names for 2021, 2020, you can see that virtually every region of the world is doing badly and even China is still growing, but nowhere near what it normally does. Now, 2022 looks a lot better for Canada. We go from a five and a half percent decline in GDP to something like a 4% growth rate in 2021. What that means is better times are coming, but we don't make up for all the lost ground we had this year. It's really a 22 story before we get back to 
you know, pre-pandemic health, start to see the unemployment rates look more like we want them to be. So it's really a, a couple of year project to get the economy back on its feet again as we get a vaccine in place. Turning to uh, the virus, you know, if this virus were something like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think it would sound like he did in The Terminator, where he's, his famous tagline was, I'll be back. And we certainly knew from previous pandemics going all the way back a century ago that viral diseases like this, they come, they go, they fade, they escalate. And while your region has certainly been, you know, in the favorable position of having kept it largely at bay, uh, that's not true for the places in the world that you trade with or draw tourism from. And, you know, the second wave in Canada is actually worse than the first wave was in the spring. This chart was drawn as of late October. The peaks have continued to escalate, particularly with the spread of the disease to some uh, of the Western Canadian provinces that had earlier been doing much better. Uh, but it's not just a story about Canada. In fact, the numbers look worse on a per capita basis in virtually every state in the US than they do in almost every Canadian province. And of course, Europe itself has also been wrestling with a huge second wave of the disease and the economic consequences of that. And the consequences, while we tend to think of them as being tied up in whether governments announce restrictions or don't announce restrictions, actually individual behavior also matters a lot to how this disease uh, impacts economic activity. Now you can see that in the good sector of the economy, and this is now turning to the US, things are actually good for goods. In other words, Americans are actually buying more goods than they were had they continued on the trend line they were on prior to the pandemic. It may be a bit of a shocker to see we're shopping more than we would have had the disease never happened. But of course, some of this is simply the substitution of shopping for services that we would have consumed instead. So the simplest one to think about is if you're not going out to a restaurant, then you're spending more at the grocery store and that shows up in good spending. Uh, if you're not traveling as much, you may be deciding to spend some money on your house or maybe you needed to turn your house into a home office and you needed a, uh, a desk chair and a, a laptop and all of that spending has elevated good spending, not only in the US but in Canada as well. But look at the chart at right and you can see the damage from the pandemic that we had a massive decline in the service sector. And the service sector is bigger in both the US and Canada than is the goods sector. So roughly three times the size in terms of consumer spending goes to services. And while we've seen a nice rebound, pretty steep from where we were in April, uh, we're nowhere near where the previous trend line was. And the problem is, is that as we look ahead, it's going to be tougher, at least until we get that shot in the arm from a vaccine, to recover the rest of the way in services. Because the part of the service sector that's still missing in action is things like concert halls, uh, hotels, airlines. In other words, the very services that people are cautious or even in some cases prohibited from consuming while the pandemic is there. So I think what we've done in the economy in the US since April is we've picked the low hanging fruit. We've engineered a quick recovery in goods as well as in the kind of services that aren't impeded much by social distancing. Um, so telecom services is a service and it's booming as people download movies instead of go to the movies. But a hole in the economy that's left unfortunately is concentrated in sectors that are tough to recover until we have that vaccine. And this will extend to your region uh, as I'll talk about later as we think about things like tourism, for example. Um, there are, um, as I said, it's not just about what governments decide, it's also what individuals decide. So this was a study done for the US, but I'm pretty sure the numbers would be similar in Canada. And what they compared was they looked at a group of states that had shut down activities uh, to control coronavirus uh, in March and April, and then reopened uh, in the early summer. And they compared that to a group of states we call the control group that were states that had the same shutdowns but delayed the reopening. And actually, if you look at total consumer spending, the path between the two groups wasn't that different. 
And that's because not everything is dependent on what governments say you can do or can't do. There's going to be an element of caution in household decisions as long as the virus is there. And if you want to talk to an industry that is seeing that, you know, talk to people in the airline industry where certainly flights are permitted. I could get on a plane tomorrow and fly to Victoria. Maybe they'd make me change planes in Vancouver. There's not as many flights these days. But the issue is, would I feel safe doing that? Am I worried about catching something on the plane? And as long as the coronavirus is out there, those fears can hold back consumers, even when governments have said, look, we're open uh, for business. Um, there are some other things that are doing very well in this pandemic, and one of them is home building. Um, so low interest rates in the U.S. are causing a bit of a house price boom. You can see builders' confidence levels of various regions of the U.S. are quite high. I showed the West here in particular. Uh, your neighbors just to the south of you, very high level of builder confidence. So lots of home building going on. What we're not seeing, though, is commercial construction. So it's offices and stores. They're in the middle of a recession, even though home building in the US is doing well. This is important for your region because home building is an important part of lumber demand. And the result of that, you know, relatively healthy pace for home building in the US uh, right through this pandemic is creating at least a base of support uh, for lumber prices in the US. Um, and But finally, we are a little worried that in the next couple of quarters, before we get that vaccine, we've got a bit of a drag on the U.S. economy coming up. We're expecting quite slow numbers by the time we get to uh, the first quarter of 2021. And it's not just that wave of the virus that we're dealing with, but it's also the fact that in the U.S. they provided huge fiscal stimulus that hit the economy in Q2 and Q3. It prevented the fall in economic activity from being worse uh, in Q2, and it helped build the lift in the economy that we saw in Q3 as households spent checks that they got from Washington, as businesses managed to hang in there with some government support. The problem is that Congress has now stalled on approving a follow-up to this deal. And if they don't, you can see the consequences in this chart is that in Q4 and Q1, the impact of fiscal policy on the US economy is a negative because you had people who got a big check for unemployment benefits, for example, but are now in the process of seeing that cut off. Now, we're still quite hopeful that even though um, the election has left the US in a hazy political position, that Congress will get its act together and approve another stimulus package either in December or at the latest after the inauguration of a new president in January, but we'll need that. And even with it, I think we can expect that until that vaccine comes, we're going to start to see some quite disappointing numbers for economic growth in the US. We're already seeing that show up in Europe as they deal with their second wave. And as I'll talk about, I think we're going to see some of that in a slowing pace of growth in Canada uh, until we get to that post-vaccine period. But rather than end the US story on a, a sad note, let me actually end on an optimistic note, because this recession or downturn that we've gone through in the US and Canada has one feature about it that makes it very tough for some people, but also leaves me optimistic that when the cure for it comes, it's actually going to be a very potent cure in terms of the pace of economic growth we might start to get in the last sort of three months or six months of 2021 and particularly in 2022. And the difference here is that this is a much more concentrated recession in terms of the types of people and the types of industries being affected than we normally see. So what this chart looks at is in the US and it looks at job losses in the recession of the financial crisis, which was 2008, compared to the job losses that we've uh, suffered so far uh, in the COVID pandemic. If you go back to the 2008 story, that was a story of a recession triggered by a collapse in the mortgage market, in home building, and then which rippled into financial services and caused you know, major problems on Wall Street. Uh, but those affected industries, the industries hit first by the source of the recession. If you look at the 15 worst subsectors for employment, 
They didn't account for the majority of the job losses. The problem was that the laid off home builders, the people who, whose mortgages were foreclosed, the people working on Wall Street who lost their jobs, they stopped spending. And then they created a ripple effect into jobs across the economy. In this cycle, largely because governments were quick to offer relief to those losing their jobs, the worst 15 industries account for the majority of the missing jobs. And that means that when we do get that cure in the form of the vaccine rolling out, we think around the middle of the year in terms of mass vaccination, it's gonna go a long way to restoring demand because we've kept households afloat. Hopefully in the US, they extend the stimulus to keep doing that for the next several months. And that means that there's some pent up demand pent up spending power from all those people who do want to go back to the movies, go to live theaters, travel again, and they've got the money building up in their bank accounts to actually finance that. And we prevented the broad ripple across the economy. So pessimistic for the next sort of six months in the US. And I think that will extend to the Northwest corridor of the, of the US as well even though right now the COVID numbers actually are worse in the Midwest than they are right on the coast on per capita terms. But I do, I do have a lot of optimism for what the end of 2021 will look like and 2022. So let's think about Canada now in this context. Uh, if I were a cheerleader for the Canadian economy, you know, I'd have my pom-poms and I'd be leading a cheer where I would say, give me a V, give me an L, what's that spell? Well, it doesn't really start the spelling of any word that I know of, but it's actually a pretty good description of the Canadian economy and by extension, actually the economy in your region as well. And we divided the Canadian economy into sort of a two thirds slice of the pie and a one third slice of the pie. Two thirds of the Canadian economy are what we call V-shaped sectors. Uh, and if you add up their economic output, it looks like the chart at left where GDP or economic activity had a huge decline, you know, 15%, that's a massive decline from February to April, but is on a steep rebound back. And we only have numbers to the end of the second quarter in this, but you can see we were making up most of the lost ground by that point. And that is largely things like the good sector other than uh, oil. It would include things like, um, uh, grocery stores, it would include things like where people can work from home, for example, financial services, all that rebounding quite nicely. But then you have a third of the economy that is what we call an L-shaped recovery, which means not much of a recovery at all. There's a huge decline, about 25%, which is something you don't see in a recession. You don't see declines like that. And in that one third of the economy, there's been barely any recovery. And that would include tourism, hospitality, restaurants, um, airlines, uh, airports, all the people whose jobs are being affected or in fact almost completely disappeared as a result of social distancing requirements. And that's the sector that now makes up a lot of the remaining jobs. And again, it's gonna to be tough to start really getting those back until the vaccine uh, starts to take hold and we get people uh, feeling and being immune again to this contagion. Uh, the global economy also matters to, to Canada and your region. You know, Canada does, uh, is somewhat resource dependent. There's been different strokes for different folks there. I spoke about uh, lumber prices being not bad shape because housing activity is strong. Copper prices have also actually held up okay in this downturn because the world is electrifying. People are looking to electric energy. China is doing better than the rest of the world. They're a big copper importer. But then for Canada as a whole, and particularly for your neighbors in one province east of you, you know, the WTI oil prices you could see are pretty lackluster levels. And when you add that up for Canada, you know, oil and gas is a bigger sector than the rest of the mining industry. So overall capital spending activity still quite depressed. Now BC of course, still getting the benefit of a big LNG project in the overall provincial growth numbers uh, for the next couple of years. So it's sort of a related sector there, uh, but overall the energy sector is still very soft. Um, 
So let's look at then what does this mean provincially? If I take a lens across for all of BC and I compare that to Canada, you know, there's a saying in this crisis you hear a lot, oh, we're all in the same boat. Uh, but if I look across the provinces, you know, some provinces are leaking oil. Their boat is also leaking oil as well as sinking a little bit. And that would include Alberta, where the GDP decline this year is much more severe than it is in BC. Uh, and the recovery will only be similar until perhaps 2022, if global growth is strong enough, you start to really get more of a meaningful recovery in oil and gas prices. But certainly both in the oil and gas sector, you know, it's been a huge hammering of activity. BC, pretty close to the national average overall. Uh, early on, it had a bit of an edge that the pandemic wasn't hitting it as hard. I think it's fair to say that uh, on the mainland of BC, that's not really true anymore. So you lost a little bit of that edge that you had before. But there are some advantages for the province that I'll talk about in terms of weathering uh, this particular crisis. Uh, if we look at uh, where we are in Canada as a whole, uh, GDP is still down about 5%, almost 5% from where it stood before the pandemic. That's our estimate for the end of Q3 numbers. We don't quite have them yet. That's about as much missing output as we had in the worst days of the last recession, where GDP had declined by 4.4%. So we still have a long way to go. As I said, the next couple of quarters will be a slower climb. Uh, but you can see that that forecast steepens out as we get into 2022. Um, so let's look at a few details that are interesting about this cycle. You know, housing is an important part of the BC economy. You know, I like to think when I look at BC over the last decade and, and you know, the South Island in particular, people moving to the province for better weather, better lifestyle reasons, uh, other factors has been a big part of economic activity. And um, one of the things we've seen perversely a bit is that Canada's housing market has been doing pretty well. If I look at Victoria house prices, you know, they're still up on a year over year basis, not as quite as much as the national average, but still doing okay. And what that relates to is the uh, very different sort of mix of jobs that we lost in this recession compared to past recessions. If we categorize occupations by pay scale and we look at the bottom sort of 25% or 50%, whatever slice you pick, in this downturn, lower end workers, lower paid workers accounted for a much larger slice of the total jobs decline than we had in past recessions. And that means that most of the hit has fallen on people who rent as opposed to own their own home. And that's why home ownership has actually been booming because people are buying single family houses in particular. Uh, maybe they want out of a high rise they were in. Um, and the fact that mortgage rates are very low is therefore providing them the borrowing capacity. And these upper income people, or at least people in the upper half of the income bracket haven't really lost a lot of their income so they can afford to buy a house. You can see that the condo market has not done as well terms of uh, house prices. Um, and that's because renters rent a lot of those condos and rents are falling in many cities because of the concentration of job losses among renters. Uh, the tourism sector, as I said, is a pretty big hit. Uh, for Canada, the tourism sector uh, is obviously much larger in the summer than it is in the winter. And the reverse is also true, uh, that we lose a lot of spending by Canadians abroad in the winter as opposed to the summer. So we already have actually, to some extent, for the country as a whole, not necessarily for every region, seen the worst of the pandemic's impact on, on the Canadian economy through its impact on tourism. So what's the logic of that? Well, if you look at Canada's balance of payments on tourism, how much we spend abroad versus how much foreigners spend in Canada. On a full year basis, Canadians spend almost half a percent of GDP more abroad than foreigners spend in Canada. So we like to get away for the winter. But if you look at Q1 in particular, which is the first bar in this chart, what that bar tells you is that Canadians spend 1% of GDP more abroad than we get during the winter quarter from foreigners uh, spending money here. So not true for the local Whistler economy, but true for Canada as a whole. 
And what that means for Canada in this winter is if Canadians decide, you know what, I don't want to get on an airplane and fly to Arizona uh, or Hawaii, or I don't want to go to Florida, then that means that those same Canadians are spending that first quarter entirely in Canada. And the money that they would have spent on food in Florida or Arizona, they're going to now spend on food in Victoria or Vancouver. That's going to actually be a net positive for the Canadian economy, a negative for the tourism business. Um, although there is a little bit of an offsetting positive if people do little local vacations, but generally still a bad picture for tourism till the vaccine's well underway. Uh, and even next summer might be still quite slow. Uh, but at least in terms of GDP as a whole in Canada, we get a little bit of more local spending as a result of people not traveling. What has also helped uh, cushion the blow of this unusual uh, pandemic is the fact that Canada's governments have been quite generous in doling out checks for people who have lost jobs, as well as trying to keep businesses afloat during a very tough period. And this, the checks that went out to the household sector were so large that even in the second quarter, which was a horrific quarter for the Canadian economy, and saw a huge decline in total labor compensation as people lost jobs, government transfer payments more than made up for that. So actually Canadians' incomes actually rose during the worst quarter of this recession, which is very unusual. And that has kept spending power sort of out there, kept people from being evicted from their homes and so on, and been an important life raft for the economy while we wait for a shot in the arm from a vaccine. Relative to other countries, Canada has actually been one of the most aggressive in using this fiscal stimulus plan uh, to get money into the hands of the unemployed and into the hands of businesses so that we can try to keep the economy from an even deeper dive uh, and have it in better shape when the virus starts to fade away. Uh, now, some people are quite worried. Well, what about all the budget deficits? You know, can we really afford that? And it's quite true that we cannot afford to have the federal government running 350 or $400 billion deficits year after year after year. Um, and BC is actually now running a large deficit as well relative to its track record. But that's not something that is really problematic if it's temporary. And my, my analysis of it is that much of what we're seeing now is in fact temporary. So if you look at the federal numbers, for example, uh, virtually all of the deficit, which at mid-year we were estimating around $350 billion, they've added some programs since then, so maybe it could be higher, but virtually all of that deficit comes from either the loss in revenues from the COVID shock to economic activity, that will go away as the economy recovers, and the emergency measures on the spending side that are temporary, that were put into place to do things like subsidize wages for employers, subsidize rents for some businesses, and of course pay generous, more generous than normal unemployment benefits to a much larger number of unemployed people than we will have when the economy recovers. The underlying deficit, if you strip out all these emergency measures and the unusual loss in government revenues is still on the order of $30 billion, which is actually relatively small as a share of GDP compared to virtually uh, all other industrialized countries. And now, we, as I did say, that BC is running a deficit this year, as is prudent given the tough economic times. But the provincial government was actually very well placed to tide the, help tide the economy over and ride through what is going to be a tough year fiscally, maybe a tough couple of years, given where it started from. So this chart looks at where provinces were in Canada in terms of uh, both budget balance as a share of GDP. So that's the vertical axis. If you're right on that line, you are at a budget balance and, and net debt, which is shown on the, the X axis. So further to the right, you have the provinces that had the most debt relative to GDP. And you can see that BC was basically in a balanced budget position ahead of this crisis. So this is the prior fiscal year we're looking at, as well as relatively a very low debt province in terms of debt to GDP. And so I'm quite confident that uh, this province, uh, BC, has the fiscal firepower, if need be, 
to help tide the economy through this. It does, again, doesn't mean you can run huge budget deficits forever, but it's the right thing and the right time and place for that. And having reduced budget deficits and, and budget uh, debts prior to this really made the province well placed to uh, provide a helping hand. Um, I'm gonna skip this chart, it's quite technical in terms of explaining the detail of it, but basically what it says is if you're borrowing at interest rates like a half a percent, like the federal government is, that's another big reason why we're not that concerned because the interest on all this debt that either the province or the federal government is accruing is not really be that onerous in terms of the tax hikes we might one day need to pay that extra interest. It's not actually that large. Uh, so let's look at some of the uh, what lies ahead. I did say that interest rates are quite low right now. That's providing support for things like housing, it's making government borrowing cheap enough that they can afford to do it for a year or two. One thing that gives us comfort on that front is that even when we look ahead and the economy returns to normal over the next few years, the new normal for interest rates remains pretty low. So if we look at the last business cycle, for example, uh, what these, this chart shows you is where did central banks around the world take short-term interest rates in that cycle versus where did they do it in the 90s? And I could have gone back to the 80s and 70s. So in the, for example, in the last cycle, the Bank of Canada bar, which is the yellow bar at left, so tells you that the short-term interest rate we reached in the last cycle was only 1.75%. We never got above that. And the economy started to slow with interest rates actually quite low. The US Federal Reserve only took interest rates up to two and a half percent. Bank of England was similar. Reserve Bank of Australia was the only one that got a little higher. But you compare that to the red bars, which is where did we peak out at short-term interest rates in the 90s? Much, much higher. The nature of the economy has changed. Simply put, for various structural reasons, it doesn't take as high an interest rate to start cooling the economy when you're worried about inflation and an overheating. So yes, we can look forward to interest rates climbing ahead, but a generally lower interest rate environment means that sectors like real estate, for example, will continue to operate with much lower interest rates than they did in the 80s or 90s. This table has our forecast for short and long-term interest rates. Uh, you can see that three-month interest rates in Canada eventually get up to 1% or so uh, as we get into 2023. But even 10-year Government of Canada rates really only end up around 1.5% uh, a couple of years from now, that's quite low by historic standards. Um, continue on to the next slide. We're, we think that, I'll go back. One of the other things that's important for, uh, go back one slide, sorry. One of the other things that's important for your region is the exchange rate, uh, because you know the South Island competes with other jurisdictions for tourist dollars. Uh, American visits are important to the region and Canada's exchange rate can either make you know, the, the South Island more or less expensive relative to competing jurisdictions. The Canadian dollar has been appreciating a bit in recent months, largely because the US dollar has been losing ground against a broad basket of other currencies. But if I look at the fundamentals for Canada's trade sector, I'm convinced that we really can't afford to have the Canadian dollar trend a whole lot stronger than it already is. So. In this chart, we're flipping it around. We're talking about how many Canadian dollars per US dollar. Right now, that number is around $1.31 Canadian for every US dollar. So if the Canadian dollar were to strengthen and the Canadian dollar drops to fewer than 130 to the, to the US dollar, for example, um, what happens? Why do I think that that's unlikely to be sustained? Well, because if you look back, Canada really did not do very well on exports whenever we've had a, a currency that's any stronger than it is right now. Exports have only been a very marginal contributor to economic growth in years where dollar Canada was below 130, or you could think of it, the Canadian dollar much stronger than 75 cents. If we wanna do well on trade, we really need a somewhat cheaper Canadian dollar than we have now. And the Bank of Canada can lean to make that happen by raising interest rates when the time comes a little later and a little more gentler than the US. So right now, Canadian interest rates are actually slightly above the US in terms of very short term rates. That's giving our currency some support. Our view is that over the next couple of years, the Bank of Canada is going to try to send a message out that 
they will be leaning towards a slower pace of interest rate hikes, which will help the Canadian dollar weaken a bit. And you can see our forecasts are more in the 133 to 139 Canadian dollars per US dollar, or, or you know, a little closer to, to 72 cents or 73 cents rather than something stronger than we have now. And that's going to help keep uh, your region competitive on the tourism side. The U.S. has also had another big event. It's not just all about the virus. We also had an election. How does Joe Biden's policies affect that outlook for Canada and your region? I think job one for any incoming president in January is taking control of the coronavirus story uh, and getting the stimulus out that the U.S. economy needs between now and when mass vaccination has really taken hold. And we've seen... I would say it's fair to say not the most coordinated federal response in the U.S. to the coronavirus. So actually, I'm quite optimistic that with a new president, the U.S. can and will do better on that front, which would be a plus for Canada. The U.S. under Biden, they were talking about tax hikes for higher income Americans. That would have actually made Canada a little more tax competitive, but I don't think that's likely to come if Republicans end up controlling the Senate. Um, we will have a run of higher deficits in the U.S. in the near term, but Republicans have not been particularly better at containing deficits than Democrats, if you look historically. So I'm not really sure there's a material difference there. What about trade? Because, of course, in B.C., we are well aware that softwood lumber has been a trade irritant. That wasn't a Trump story. That's been an on again, off again story under both party administrations. And I think it's fair to say, well, that Biden will be a more predictable partner on trade. We will have fewer on again, off again surprises. He's not fully a free trader either. And in particular, one concern we have is he's very strongly advocating a buy America policy for anything the federal government in the US buys. That could be a barrier to some Canadian exports. And again, I don't think on the lumber issue, the party in power has really not had much of a difference for Canada and how we are able to deal with that. Climate change, much more aggressive policy on that coming from Biden. That means like alternative energy is going to be getting a bit of a growth lift there. And he doesn't need congressional approval for all of that. Some of that can come uh, by regulation. Uh, pi pipelines, of course, a bit of an opponent there, a bit of a negative for Alberta. Uh, on that regard. I think one of the interesting angles for China and for BC is, you know, China is a very important trading partner for British Columbia and also a very important source of immigrants and tourists. And it's not just the US that's had a fractious relationship with China, it's Canada as well. And to some extent, our problems with China are tied up with the US problems with China. You know, we all know about uh, the Huawei case and then the, uh, you know, the response by China taking a couple Canadians hostage in effect, but also launching some trade irritants that have bothered Canada on the trade front. We are a bit more hopeful that uh, a Biden administration will be able to talk tough with China where necessary, but also be a little more cooperative on other fronts with China. And just maybe that will cool some of the Canada-China tensions along with it, which could be important for our trade relationship with China. And the last one, this is more of a competitive challenge, is you know, Canada is a country that's depended a lot on immigrants, BC in particular. And Joe Biden not only wants to be you know, a little more amenable to refugees coming, but also wants to expand the US in terms of its acceptance of skilled workers coming on uh, those kind of visas. And it's gonna make it a bit tougher for Canada to shop around the world for the best and brightest and tell them, come to Canada come live here, bring your high tech company here, uh, bring your high tech workers to Canada, because the US might start to try to play uh, that same game. Immigration has been, as I said, a very important part of uh, the British Columbia story, as well as the Canadian story. If you look at the flow of immigrants as a share of population, you know, the bars for BC are on the right, uh, other than PEI and, you know, I don't know, PEI, if, I guess if 10 families show up, it's a big increase in population. But relative to the, say, let's say uh, provinces that have you know, reasonable populations, you know, BC is pretty much at the top of the list in terms of the reliance on immigration. 
That, of course, has slowed now. Uh, you know, the pandemic is causing a stall out in, in cross-border flows, not just with the U.S., but with other countries as well. So we're expecting when we do have the final 2020 numbers, we'll have seen a slowing in immigration. Uh, but we've heard from the Trudeau government that their intention is to actually, as we come out of the pandemic, have some offsetting increases in immigration targets. So we we should be able to make up for that lost ground, which is very important for uh, that uh, story. And we looked back at what happened in past recessions. You can see that the trend has been certainly escalating for immigration relative to overall population growth. I shaded in the chart at right um, what happened in last past recessions. Immigration did slow in the wake of the recession in the early 90s. But then it picked up again. So I, I think this is a temporary lull in immigration. And one other hidden story here in the immigration numbers may be what happens to Canadians living abroad. Uh, right now, there are, the number of Canadian citizens living abroad, we estimate, is roughly the equivalent to the entire population of Alberta. Now, I'm not expecting them to all decide to come home at once. But the reality is there's two pieces to the story that could be affected by political and other trends going on right now. One is that Canadians are not moving south to the U.S. So we are retaining people this year who otherwise would have gone abroad. So that is elevating our domestic population a bit. But also some of those Canadians living abroad live in places that maybe don't seem as attractive as they used to. And in particular, I know I'm on politically sensitive ground here, but I'm thinking of the hundreds of thousands of Canadian citizens who live in Hong Kong. Obviously, we've got some tough political developments going on there. Uh, if dissatisfaction grows, you know, Canada and BC in particular could end up getting a share of these people who decide to come home again uh, to where they hold the citizen. So this, the theme of this was mega trends. I do want to talk about looking with my crystal ball beyond the COVID world of 2021, or at least the first half of 2021, and say, and ask what part of the mixed up world that we seeing now is likely to persist? And you often hear people say the phrase during a crisis, the world will never be the same. I remember hearing that after 9-11, we're not gonna build tall office buildings or fly, and of course we did. After the Berlin Wall, wall fell, I remember people thinking Russia was going to be a peaceful capitalist democracy. It didn't quite work out all that way. And sometimes the world actually is more like it had been than what you see in the middle of a crisis. So when I think about this crisis, what I use is a concept called revealed preference. What were the choices that were being made by businesses and households when they had the choices to make prior to the pandemic? What were they telling us about the underlying trend? So for example, most of us were working in an office. Many people were working in offices before the pandemic. There was a very slight trend towards work from home. My view is that most people will end up back in offices. There are definite productivity gains as well as I think uh, mental health gains by being around your colleagues rather than stuck in your uh, house a day after day. Um, online retailing, however, was a different story. It was trending higher in advance of this pandemic. Now, it's picked up a huge share of activity, particularly in cities that have been harder hit than Victoria, where people are afraid to go to stores. They've been shopping online. I think some of that market share for e-commerce will reverse when it feels safe to go pick your own lettuce or tomatoes or try on the sweater in the store. But nevertheless, because there was a trend and now more people have sampled that idea, I think we're gonna end up with a, a greater share for online retailing than when we went into the pandemic. So main streets do have an issue in terms of, I think, filling some of the space that will have been opened up during this period. I mentioned digitization. You know, downtown's not, I don't think probably true in your region, but downtowns are looking pretty quiet in many major cities. Some people thought that everyone's gonna to flee to the suburbs or rural areas to escape the virus. That hasn't necessarily been true because small towns have also had the disease. I think downtowns will make a huge comeback again when all the activities return to downtowns. And important for your region, what about leisure travel? Well, again, revealed preferences tell you a lot there. What they show is that worldwide, households were spending an increasing share of their income on experiences like tourism rather than on goods prior to the pandemic.
So my view is that leisure travel will make more than a full comeback when all of this is done. People are dying to travel again. Right now, they're just not willing to risk dying to travel. But when that's no longer a risk, I think we're going to have a huge recovery in, in leisure travel. The only question mark there is what about cruises? Because you know they had a particularly bad rep uh, that built up on this and this wasn't the first thing that affect them on the illness size you know some of you may remember some other infections that spread across cruise ships you know they may suffer a a more permanent blow in terms of the ability to further to fully recover after this although there will again be a recovery and i think restaurant dining again that was another experience that people were spending more on it will make a full comeback uh, the one area of travel that could be held back a bit and it is important for your region is business travel. So I think big conferences will come back. It's important to meet your customers, but will travel, for example, to meet your colleagues of your own company in other cities return? Or will we be more using this sort of technology that we're using today? I think some of that will linger. So we may only get an incomplete recovery. But those are some of the ways I think about the future versus the present is what was already trending and what just came out of the blue because of this pandemic. If that's the kind of thing you're looking at, I think it's more likely to go back to the world as we knew it than things that were already trending a certain way. So with, um, so with that, there's our warning of, uh, which you can read in the fine print about the future may not end up exactly as Avery Schenfeld said. Uh, but hopefully, you know, one of the things I always wish people as I get to the end of my formal presentations are, is I hope that a year from now, we're, we're living in more precedented times because I know like me, you're probably tired of living in these unprecedented times. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Avery. That was um, a lot of insight in a short period of time. And I know we actually have quite a few questions, which we'll, um, we won't be able to get through because we've got about five minutes here, um, but, but we'll get through some of um, the, the, the top ones. Um, and before I do that, just a reminder to the audience that we'll invite attendees now to submit your questions through the Zoom Q&A. Um, and the session is being recorded and you can submit your questions anonymously if you prefer. Um, and if possible, please use the Zoom Q&A chat and the production team will be monitoring the Whobit chat and move it over to this platform. Um, and also a reminder that if you have any uh, takeaways from today, please use the hashtag, uh, right, hashtag Rising Economy Week 2020. Okay, so um, I love, I, I think I loved the Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. Um, slide. And so we did have a few questions that sort of picks up on on the that that threat that that um, in fact um, Arnold is giving us here. And in, in Victoria, this is is important to us, I think, in particular, um, you know, you talked about the V shaped recovery and the L shaped recovery. And we are um, extremely um, exposed in terms of our, um, our exposure to tourism, of course, a recreation, a lot of these service led industries that have been um, so badly impacted. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can give us some advice on, you know, how do we actually build up uh, more immunity, let's say, economic immunity uh, to these, these sort of threats of being back, these future, what we call black swan events that perhaps, you know, as Dr. Miles Drucker told us yesterday, aren't actually black swans, but they can be predicted. So um, Avery, this sort of pulls on about three questions here. Can you give us some advice on how to prepare for the unpreparable? So I hope we're not having another once in a century pandemic before the next century, because this was a once in a century thing, but there is concern that could this happen again. Actually, there is some good news on that front that you may not have, that you may have seen, but maybe not fully appreciated, which is that the two vaccines that were just announced, the, with, which use a brand new technology, that technology actually holds out promise for how we deal with the next pandemic. Because it turns out that it's actually not that difficult for them to basically type in another disease and, and create a vaccine for that. So actually, our ability to get a vaccine for some new disease is certainly improved. Now, we still would want to do better than we did in this cycle. And I think there were some important lessons taken by governments about pandemic preparation and so on and earlier travel restrictions. We can look at other countries that have done better than Canada. We pat ourselves back for doing better than the US, but um, the, uh, for example, East Asia did better than Canada. Uh, Finland did better than Canada. 
And part of it was a quicker reaction in terms of closing borders and shutting down travel. So that doesn't help the tourism business, but it protects the economy at large. And, and one of the things I think that we take away from this experience, and we're still going to be taking away, unfortunately, for the next six months or so, is we do need, when we ask some businesses to sort of fall on the sword for the public health of the rest of us, I think we owe them some compensation. We owe them actually, and we, we recognize it for the workers, we're giving them generous unemployment benefits, but I think we need to do a little more for the owners. So. You know, I'm out there and controversially been saying for a few months in Ontario, for example, that, you know, we needed to shut down some things again before the government actually did it. And also been on the side of we can't open them again until the caseloads are down lower. We can't be too impatient about reopening. But in exchange for that, I think we have to write a check to the restaurant owner and so on, because if we're telling you, you close down because I don't want to get sick, well, then maybe collectively, as a, think of it as a country, we get together and we basically say, yes, and let's compensate those business owners. And that's important because we also don't want main streets to be wiped out before we're ready to reopen them. So mm -hmm. it's really a survival tactic we need. And as businesses, you know, you have to really think about living to see the brighter day at the end of the, the vaccination period later next year. That's a great, that's a great answer. Um, I got another very good question here from, from Tina um, in, in Vancouver, Minerva. Um, and she's asking about uh, um, stakeholder capitalism and, and a lot of the trends that we're seeing um, emerge, especially during this pandemic. I think um, um, ESG, so in, environmental social governance, um, mutual funds and, um, are, are seeing inflows that they've never seen before. They're doing a lot better than a lot of um, traditional funds. You're also seeing, um, you know, movement of millennials um, more interested in, in investing in terms of um, purpose-driven organizations and so on, and um, maybe more of a rise of stakeholder capitalism. Um, and in fact, Mr. Macklem, the head of Canada Central Bank yesterday, uh, is actually quoted saying how well we address climate change is becoming a competitiveness issue for Canadian businesses, so a bottom line issue. Um, can you speak a little bit to some of the opportunities to, uh, you know, address some of these big pressing issues of our time, like climate change, through um, some of the stimulus work and through some of our recovery strategies? So this is certainly going to be an area of growth um, in terms of, you know, if we if we look out over the next several decades, and I, and there's an if here, if governments actually do what they say they're going to do, which they don't always do, we've missed a few targets along the way. But there will be then opportunities in alternative energy and so on. And people look at things like hydrogen and so on and, and solar, wind and so on. But, you know, this is a transition. So it's not going to be tomorrow that we're going to tell everyone to burn their gas burning cars or, can, or just sort of trash every aircraft that's flying in the sky. And so for Canada, it's really a balancing act here. It's we want to be positioned so that we're participating in the growth industries, but we don't want to kill all of our, you know, all of the industries that we think, oh, that'll be phased out. Yes, it might over decades, but, you know, we, we still want to sort of be in the game in some other things as well. So I think it's a very delicate balancing act. I understand that investors are voting with their dollars. And in some sense, it makes perfect sense, even from an economic perspective. They're voting into things that they think will be growth industries, and they very well might. Um, but it's a competitive game, too. Canada's not going to win the, you know, the battle for these things just by, you know, sort of saying, oh, we're green here. Um, it, these are going to be very competitive industries. And we start off with some advantages in some of them and some disadvantages. And one of the things that concerns me, for example, is Joe Biden's talking about a huge infrastructure spend on green initiatives, but at the same time, he's saying, I want everything to say made in America. So that's not good because if I was gonna locate a plant, for example, to build batteries that are gonna help store solar energy, what side of the Canada-US border am I going to put it on? Well, if I want to rule myself out of all US government contracts, I can put that in Canada. On the other hand, maybe I'll put it in the US. So this is like, it's, it's, it, it, it still brings the same competitive challenges as we face in, in other industries, that it's fine to have the right idea that these are going to be growth sectors, but we shouldn't assume that Canada is going to magically uh, get a given market share. 
Okay, thank you. Well, Avery, I wish we had time to answer um, so many of these questions. They were, this was a fascinating uh, talk and we'd love to have you back in uh, in the winter, in the dredges of uh, January or February. Um, and you can kind of give us some hope, I think, for, for a spring, um, a positive spring full of vaccine for everybody. Um, and in the meantime, I want to- she says April for when Americans will start to get, be able to get it just because they want it, as opposed to they're a doctor or a person who works in a long-term care hospital. So we've well, got a few months to go probably. Yeah, well, we learned though that Canada, um, we learned yesterday that Canada is stockpiling 10 vaccines per um, resident. So yes. we're actually leading the I world. I got just warn you, did anyone tell you what the delivery date is? <laughs> <laughs> That's really it's like when that package is coming from somewhere you ordered. <laughs> when is my package coming? So yes. yes, we've ordered many vaccines, but so far publicly disclosed is only that these will be delivered in 2021, not a whole lot of detail on how many in the first quarter, the second quarter, so on. So it, it it's still, I think, a little bit of a waiting game here. Absolutely.